3 and Part 4. Now look at Part 1. Part 1 You will hear a telephone conversation between a client who wants to rent short-term accommodation and a rental agent. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning. Ace Accommodation. How can I help you? Good morning. I'd like to organise some short-stay accommodation on the Gold Coast, please. Certainly. Who am I speaking to? Miss McKinley. Sylvia McKinley. Could you spell your family name for me, please? It's M-A-C-K-I-N-L-A-Y. Thank you. And your first name is Sylvia? Yes. Is that with an I or a Y? A Y, the old-fashioned way. That's S-Y-L-V-I-A. Thank you, Miss McKinley. Now, just for our records, can you tell me what country you live in? Of course. It's England, actually. I thought so. Now, when are you coming? Well, at the moment, we're planning on arriving on July the 26th. Oh, the 25th. That's the last day of the public holiday, and it might be difficult to find something available on that date. No, we're coming on the 26th of July. Oh, well, that's fine then. We'll have lots of good places vacant by then, although you wouldn't be able to move in until late afternoon because our cleaning crew will need time to get everything ready for you. That suits us. Our flight won't get in until early evening anyway. How many of you will there be? Just my sister and myself. And how long do you intend to stay for? Oh, only a couple of weeks. We'd like to stay longer, but we'll have to get back to work. So, you're not coming on business, then? No, it's just a holiday. Why? What difference does that make? Oh, you'd be surprised. Business people have different needs. You know, wireless internet, even fax machines and photocopiers. No, we won't need any of that stuff. We'll be coming to relax and get away from all that kind of thing. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Good. Now, what exactly are you looking for? A house, a duplex or an apartment? What's a duplex? Oh, that's what you might call a townhouse or a unit. You know, two houses semi-detached on the same property. Oh, I see. I think an apartment will suit us just fine. And how many bedrooms? Two? One or two. It depends on the size. My sister and I don't mind sharing, if it's a decent-sized bedroom with two beds. Well, that makes it easier. And car parking? Will you require a lock-up garage? They're a little harder to find with an apartment. We'll have a higher car, and as far as I know, there are no regulations concerning car parking. I think as long as it's not parked on the street and it's secure, there shouldn't be any problems. OK. Now, I'm assuming you want something by the beach. Yes, that's the idea. We want to enjoy the surf, sand and sunshine. OK, but before we settle on an area and discuss your price range, I'll need to know about other necessities. What do you mean? Well, for example, do you want to be close to a shopping mall or the casino or the fun parks? Or do you want to be in a complex with or near a swimming pool? 
No, none of that really matters to us. But we'd like to have reasonable access to the motorway so that we can drive up to Brisbane to visit friends there. Well, there are quite a few lovely small towns to choose from. There's Main Beach, which is north of Surfer's Paradise, or Mermaid Waters, which is a bit further south, or Palm Beach, which is quite a bit further south. Mermaid Waters sounds delightful. Is it close to the motorway? Well, not really. The M1 is actually closest to Palm Beach, and prices are likely to be more reasonable there too. That's settled then. Palm Beach it is. Now, if you'll just give me your email address, I can send you information about the town and lots of photos. Well, my email is smac13 at hotmail.com. And one final thing. How much are you looking to spend per week on accommodation? Do you want something at the luxury end of the market? You know, newly redecorated, great views, all the mod cons? Not necessarily. Could we get something clean, comfortable and reasonable for $1,200 a week? Could you stretch that to $1,500 a week? I've got a property in mind that you'll absolutely love, but you'd have to go to $1,500. 1200 wouldn't cover it. All right, then. But that's our top limit. Good. I'll get on to this straight away, and there should be something in your inbox shortly. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a student counsellor giving information and advice about further study. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Are you thinking about further study? Well, listen to this before you make a decision. It will help you decide if going on to tertiary study is right for you, and it will help you make good decisions for the right reasons. It includes information about student life, what it will cost, and the different ways you can support yourself. What should you think about first? Well, obviously, you're thinking about tertiary study, and it's one of the biggest decisions you'll make in your life. What you decide now will affect the rest of your life. It's the last year of high school for most of you, and you're busy and under pressure. Perhaps you're thinking of going abroad, getting a job or working for just a year or two to save some money before getting back to study. Let's assume you're choosing to continue studying next year. It's important that you set yourself goals and plan how you're going to achieve them. First off, career goals. What career do you want to pursue, or what is it your parents want you to do? Then, you need to think about employment opportunities at the end of your study. Will your qualification assist you in finding a rewarding job? Thirdly, course selection. Exactly what qualifications will you need? For instance, a degree, a diploma, or something else? Now we're down to study goals. The number of papers you can study at a time, and what sort of grades you would like to attain.
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. Now, how do you make all that happen? You might feel overwhelmed by all the choices, but there are people and agencies to help. Career Services is a great website with lots of useful information and a search tool for finding courses and providers throughout the country. Then, there are the tertiary education institutions themselves. Universities and institutes of technology, for example, have comprehensive information on their particular websites. You can find out most anything there. Many campuses have a student support association and they can tell you a lot about what to expect. Don't be afraid to ask them anything. I'm sure they've heard it all before. It might also be worthwhile to make inquiries with potential employers to see if they will fund or partially fund your studies. If it is a trade you want to learn, the apprenticeship scheme will help you earn while you learn. That way you'll get valuable work experience while you're studying. If you're still at school, then search out your school careers advisor who will have a variety of information and resources at hand and be able to give you the kind of guidance you need to make a fully informed decision. And last but not least, don't forget your parents and other family members. They can be of enormous help too. Oh, one last thing that might help you make up your mind. Have you thought of applying for a scholarship? Some embassies, governments and individual institutions offer scholarships to cover part or all of your study fees. Most large libraries have a comprehensive catalogue of the various grants, awards and scholarships that are available. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 3. Part 3. You will hear a student, Penny, talking to two friends, Ray and Louise, about a television competition Ray has entered called Travel Documentary. Before you hear the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi, haven't seen you two in ages. What have you been up to? Hi Penny, Ray is really excited. He's just been shortlisted for travel documentary. He could be off travelling around the world for three months. Travel documentary? What's that? You've never heard of it? Don't you watch TV? Well, actually, no, hardly ever, especially since I've started working on my thesis. I don't have time to breathe, let alone watch TV. So what's this all about, Ray? Well, actually, it, it's a competition run by Public TV. It involves my two great loves, travel and filmmaking. Is it that program where people are sent around the world making documentary videos? 
I have heard of it. Fantastic! So you've been chosen? Not yet. I'm one of 34 selected for an interview next week, so I've made it through the first cut. Yeah, there were over 200 applicants from around the country. Pretty amazing, hey? Well, I've been lucky so far. What's the next stage? 13 are chosen from the interview to do a four-week training course in documentary filmmaking. Then, the eight finalists get sent off with a video camera to travel around the world. Sounds incredible! What's the catch? The catch is that every two weeks you have to send in a 10-minute video from a different part of the world. It's broadcast on TV along with the work of three of the other competitors and judged by a panel of experts and the TV audience. So you're under a lot of pressure. Wow, I guess so. You mean you're on television every two weeks? Yep, that's right. But first, I have to be selected. Do you have to have any filmmaking experience to apply? Some background in photography or video making helps. But you're not supposed to be an expert. In fact, you can't apply if you've already worked in filmmaking. We all get the same four-week course, so we start with the same skills. Can you go anywhere in the world you want? Each competitor makes up his or her own travel plans and has to get them approved. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions 27 to 30. Have you talked with anyone else who has done it? As a matter of fact, just last week, I met Sarah Price, a girl from here who did it last year. What did she have to say about it? She said it was the most amazing experience of her life, but it was really tough at times. I think you'd have to be really brave to take off like that alone with so much responsibility. It's not like going on a holiday, is it? <laughs> no. Two weeks in a country often where you can't speak the language to find a story, film it, organise all the editing. Then you're off to a completely different part of the world to start all over again. Pretty exhausting, but exciting too. What a way to see the world. What about Sarah Price? Did she have any bad experiences? She said the worst part was when she got some mysterious fever in Mongolia and thought she might have to be sent home. Fortunately, it got better, but she said it was scary to feel really ill when you're alone so far away. So what made you want to apply? When I saw the program on TV a while ago, I thought, this is for me. I've always wanted to travel, but needed to work for a year before I could even think about it. Then a new series started up. I thought, now's my chance. Don't you think you'll be lonely? I don't think I'll have time to be homesick. I'm more worried about having too much to do and not enough time to get things organised. So we might be watching you on television in the next few months? I hope so, if I'm lucky. When will you know for sure? They choose the final eight in March. A month later, you're on your way. So do you have to pay anything? Nothing. It's all paid for. Course, camera, flights, accommodation and in-country travel. The budget is pretty tight, though. No extras. I sure hope you get it. Then I'll be finding time to watch at least one program on television every week. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on the work of a printing department at a university. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I am here to give you a brief outline of the work of this new department. The Department of the Printed Word has a very short history, having been created just 10 years ago. Some statistics to start with. The first intake of undergraduate students consisted of 20 students, which rose to 37 in the second year and we now have about 50 in the first year, doing a wide range of courses, full and part-time. We have a thriving research department, with 17 students on the taught MA course, and 7 students doing research full-time. In all, we have 9 full-time lecturers, and 16 part-time lecturers, who work mainly, but not exclusively, in our evening department. Of the total student body, approximately 21% are from outside the country, a number which has been increasing steadily over recent years. Although students from overseas have to reach a minimum level of competence in English before they follow a course at the university, some may require remedial help with their English. And we can offer help through the student support services as part of the general assistance given to all students. For home students, both graduate and undergraduate, there are bursaries to help with travel and accommodation, for which I would advise you to contact Mrs. Riley at the end of this session. Increasingly, we are forging external links with organisations in the publishing world, and we have been very fortunate in that we have received money to sponsor not just various students within the department, but also technicians and lecturers. Each year we hold a series of lectures which are given by external speakers in the world of printing and the media. The series of workshops that you see around you have been built thanks to a very generous donation which has allowed us to develop our facilities for bookbinding and restoration. Now, the main work of the department relates to teaching the mechanism of printing. And as most printing is now so highly technological, all our students have to be computer literate. For those of you who are interested in taking a module in this department from another department and who feel that you may not have the necessary computer skills, don't let the technology put you off. We have a number of specialist technicians who can support and deliver crash programs in the computing technology required. As long as you can switch on the computer, you are halfway there. We have what can only be called state-of-the-art facilities, especially for those wishing to move into the publishing world, working not just as printers, but also in editing, page design, layout and bookbinding. With the extensive facilities we have for book restoration, some of our former students are now employed as expert book restorers and conservationists, skills which were once almost dying out. In the display, you will notice samples of work on book cover design, and as well as having all the necessary computer programs for dealing with printing, we have some old printing presses. Despite being largely a modern department, we do have an increasing interest in research into the history of the printed word, ranging from early European to Chinese and Japanese printing techniques. We have in fact some very well-known experts on early printing in Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries. If this area appeals to you, you can talk to Dr. Fred Clare afterwards. From China, we're lucky to have as a visiting lecturer Dr. Yu, who is an authority on early Chinese manuscripts and printing machines. If you are thinking about doing a module with us, 
or you are interested in doing research after you have finished your first degree, the person to talk to is Professor Clarkson, who will be able to give you all the details. For postgraduate research, you should really be thinking about applying now, even though we are only in December, as the department now attracts large numbers of people and we always have many applications for each research position. That is the end of part four.